Greetings, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on what time zone you find yourself in today. Uh, and welcome to the latest edition of the Diplomats webinar series. Today, we are going to be talking about South Korea's presidential election, uh, which is going to have huge implications for international affairs. But today, we're going to be mostly focusing on the domestic side of things, what this means for South Korea, um, both now and over the long term. So on March 9th, South Koreans are going to be heading to the polls to elect their next president. And the two main candidates are Lee Jae-mung of the Democratic Party, which is currently in power with President Moon Jae-in. And the opposition party, People Power Party, um, is fielding the candidate Yoon suk yeol And both those two have been locked into a tight race since they won their primary battles. But regardless of who eventually emerges victorious, the issues that are defining this race are going to have important implications for South Korea's society and democracy moving forward. So that is going to be our focus today, not so much trying to predict the race because South Korean politics is always unpredictable, but exploring the issues at stake and how the concerns that we're seeing brought up during the campaign are going to define South Korea going forward. So to help us explore these questions, I am very happy to have three phenomenal experts on Korean politics and society. Um, we're going to be starting with Carl Friedhoff, who is a fellow in public opinion and Asia policy at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. We're also joined by Song Kim, who is the director of public affairs and the internship coordinator at the Korea Economic Institute of America. And um, joining us also from Seoul is Dr. Lee Suk Jong, the Professor of Public Administration at Sung Kyung Kwan University's Graduate School of Governance. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and I want to get started so that we'll have plenty of time for a question and answer at the end. Carl, we're going to start with you. Um, just can you give us a quick overview of the main issues that are at play in the campaign today and maybe some of the broader implications that that might have? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Shannon, and to, to everyone at The Diplomat uh, for, for putting this together. Um, I'd like to start with just kind of taking an overview of the state of the race, um, because if you've been following uh, this election at all, you've probably seen uh, a number of polls coming out showing, showing how close the race is, or, or in some cases, how close the race is not. And, you know, in my estimation, the race is actually close, despite what you're seeing out of some of the polls, you know, and, and what we found is that some of these polls that show Yoon suk yeol with an, an eight to 10 point lead are generally down to methodology. Uh, the, closest, the closest polls are out of Gallup Korea and the National Barometer Survey. Um, they have it about even. Uh, we're expecting a new round of polls today and, and tomorrow uh, from them. But both of those polls, the one thing they have in common is that they use a live interviewer to do it. These polls that have, uh, that have a bigger gap, you know, again, anywhere from seven to 10 points, usually use an automated response system or an interactive voice response. And those are producing, if you put them on a scatter plot, uh, it generally looks pretty clear that they, they favor you. And that's not only from a methodology mix, but also from the sampling mix that they use. And I think one of the best examples of this is polls from RealMeter, where when they were using a lower mix of, of interviews, uh, of live interviews, their polling gap was quite wide, but as they started to increase their number of live interviews as term, in terms of percentage, the gap actually became narrower. And now even they are showing uh, other races between two and three points. Um, I bring this up because again, you know, you can have a wildly different view of the election based on, on the polls you see with some showing a very close race, some showing uh, quite a big gap. And one of my concerns is that I think it's still very possible for E.J. Myung to, to win a, a very tight race, but then what happens after that? Um, I, there's already been some talk about an election fraud narrative being, being uh, brought out by some of the more fringe conservatives, and I think they're going to end up pointing to some of this election polling that has uh, Yoon with a 10-point lead, and they'll say, well, see, that's evidence of this election fraud, when really it's the result of poor sampling and questionable uh, methods. So that, that's the, the, the first point. Now, for the main issues, you know, foreign policy has basically been a no-show uh, throughout this election. And that's for, for a couple of reasons, you know, just like elections almost anywhere, foreign policy is rarely uh, featured in, in elections. You know, it features a little bit more in, in the United States just because the United States is so forward-leaning in its foreign policy, but here it hasn't really come up. In, in the latest polling that I've seen when they broke it down by issues, and this was not kind of a comprehensive list of the issues, 50% um, said real estate policy was the single most important 
And then the other list, way down the list, was North Korea policy at 10%. But even then, North Korea was essentially grouped with coronavirus policy or managing personnel you know, in government, uh, both at 9%. So North Korea is bunched in uh, with a lot of other things. Now, part of the reason for that uh, kind of homogeneity on, on foreign policy, or, or why, we're, why I think we're seeing some homogeneity from the campaigns on foreign policy, uh, is because public opinion, number one, doesn't rate it highly in terms of the election, but also there's a lot of agreement among the public about the importance of foreign policy and the way they think about foreign policy. You know, take, for example, the United States. Um, you know, the, the alliance here is highly supported. Uh, we, every once in a while, we hear things about you know, anti-American sentiment, but the reality is that when we, when we look at this in the, in the polling data, 85 to 90% approve of the United States alliance. And so when that comes to election time, you're less likely to see wide gaps in how both candidates are going to approach the United States. Now, on the US, there, there is homogeneity, but I do think that if, if E.J. Myung ends up being elected, there's a little more ground for friction between the United States and Korea, and this is for a number of reasons. Um, part of it is that I think his foreign policy camp is not unitary. While we have, while we have Ambassador Lee Sung Lak kind of as, as the face and representing this pragmatic approach that E.J. Myung wants to take, um, there are also other camps within that that are less publicized, I think, and there may be disagreement at times about the direction to take. So it could be a little more of, of, of a wild card uh, in that sense. Um, but also, you know, um, E.J. Myung, I think, has, has a tendency to say what he wants to say. And at times, you know, he may, he may say the wrong thing, and that might lead to friction uh, as well. And we're going to see a, a kind of disagreements with the United States in, in his North Korea engagement policy uh, down the road. If, if you were to win, I think the, the alliance, the relationship with the U.S. will be much smoother um, because he's, we kind of know how he's going to deal or want to deal with North Korea. But also his foreign camp, uh, his foreign policy camp seems relatively united. There's one advisor and we kind of know how the, the structure of that is, is currently uh, going to work. But when we think about kind of the, the relationship between Korea, Korea and the United States going forward, it's going to be even more highly judged on how Korea is dealing with other countries in the region and, and specifically China. Now, China, I think, is the biggest differentiator between the two camps. Um, Lee's camp has said that he wants to remain equidistant between China and the United States, while uh, Yoon suk yeol has been kind of talking tough on China and says that he, he, uh, he wants to openly declare sides with the United States. But this is going to be a difference if, if, of, of action versus words. And I think both of them are hemmed in somewhat by the fact that China is, is such an important player uh, economically. So, you know, Yoon has, uh, again, taken this, this quite tough approach. Um, but if you look at quotes from his key campaign staff on foreign policy, you know, they clearly recognize the importance of China as, as, as an economic partner and that their, their hands are going to be somewhat tied in how, how much they can in, kind of enforce or back up that tough talk. Uh, Lee, on the other hand, you know, saying he wants to be equidistant, well, you know, as, as he moves forward, he might say the wrong things and not want to, uh, to, not, to, not want to offend China, but what has ended up going to happen is that he's going to focus his defense acquisitions on naval power and missiles, and in the long term, that's going to be actually quite good uh, for the state of the alliance. So, you know, they, they start off with a relatively wide gap. But I think as whoever's going to be elected, they'll, they'll end up closer to a position that benefits the United States, even though uh, they started out in a different place. One of the, the most important factors, though, here, I think, is going to be positions on the quad. Um, you know, E.J. EJ Myung is, is somewhat circumspect on that because of the, the uh, capability to offend China and potential economic sanctions. That memory is, is still fresh here, uh, for sure. But Yoon suk Yeol wants to get involved with the quad and be, become kind of an official member of the Quad Plus. Um, you know, before this election kicked off, I remember talking with key people within the campaign staff now, and there was a big focus on, on Southeast Asia. And so if Yoon is elected, I think there's gonna be a lot more cooperation in Southeast Asia with the Quad from South Korea. Of course, South Korea is already quite active there um, and through, through kind of the new Southern policy rolled out by Moon Jae-in. They might rename it, but I still think that the Yoon campaign is gonna follow up on that, that and be much more active. Um, finally, another point of friction uh, could be on, on North Korea policies, uh, and that's not necessarily with Yoon. Yoon is going to take the kind of traditional hard line, 
uh, that, that Washington is going to be much more comfortable comfortable with. They're going to seek to further isolate North Korea and, and do kind of the traditional things that conservatives do. Uh, but with E.J. Myung, you know, he's, he said that he's going to seek engagement. He's going to try to cooperate first. But my sneaking suspicion there is that, again, Lee wants to be pragmatic. But I also get the sense that he can be a bit of a hothead at times. You know, we've heard these recordings of him kind of, um, of using very choice language to, to speak to people uh, around him. And so I wonder, instead of taking this very principled engagement approach where it's no matter what North Korea does, he's going to, to maintain that approach. I have the feeling if there are provocations that he'll be able to turn quite quickly and, and uh, take on uh, a harder line. So I'll go ahead and wrap up there. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, that's a very useful overview of the general issues at play. Uh, and I'm going to turn to Song now to talk about some more issues that have been pulling the campaigns apart from each other. Um, gender, in particular, has played, uh, I would say, an outsized role in this campaign, maybe compared to others. Um, also, technology, uh, particularly given that how to jumpstart the economy has been a huge issue. Um, you know, really for every country, but for South Koreans as well, that's a major area of concern. And Song, I know that you write about these issues and follow them closely. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about how these topics are playing out in the campaign. Sure. Uh, well, thank you again, Shannon, for this opportunity and everyone at Diplomat. It's great to be on this panel uh, with Carl and Dr. Lee to talk about the election coming up. Um, and I can't believe it's just a couple of weeks away. Um, so for me, as Shannon mentioned, I'll be talking about the technology policy and also gender issues uh, leading up to the election. So to start off, the technology, as Shannon mentioned, it, especially in, in the IT, uh, IC, ICT sector, is increasingly becoming an important part of Korea's economy and also where the country is headed. Uh, we all recognize Samsung, LG, SK as some of the leading companies representing Korea and uh, the ICT sector has been doing really well um, in the recent years, especially even with the, the pandemic slowing down everything. Um, the, the export from the ICT sector has been increasing. Uh, they, it hit the, the record high just last year and it increased over 20% just from the year before. So there's a lot of hope and expectation from the ICT sector. Uh, globally, we're seeing a lot of investments and development in this area, especially as we as the pandemic pushed us towards the virtual world even faster. I'm sure you've heard of the word metaverse uh, in some shape or form everywhere, especially in Korea. Um, so South Korea has a lot of potential and ambition for becoming the global leader in this in this uh, area. And with that in mind, I want to talk about a little bit about the the, the role of the pre South Korean president and how we see this election affecting the technology, the uh, policy. So uh, historically, we've seen a couple of South Korean presidents play a big role in leading some of the, the, uh, the government initiatives to get pushed, uh, so to get started on, um, especially the infrastructure and like the investment side of things. So President Kim Dae-jung is a, is a good example of really pushing to make sure that South Korea has the, the infrastructure to have fast internet across the country. And we saw with the president Moon Jae-in uh, just recently, he's been pushing for the digital new deal, investing a lot heavily on the infrastructure and R&D on the key digital technologies, such as the network infrastructure, artificial intelligence, and hoping to create jobs in, in years down the road. So, so that's some of the examples of the president playing a big role in technology. And last year, we also saw a couple of developments with the South Korean uh, National Assembly uh, playing a big role in, in the technology as well. So uh, obviously, the National Assembly right now is a majority from the Democratic Party. And last year, we saw that South Korean National Assembly was the first legislative body in the world to pass the legislation against uh, big 10 companies, such as Apple and Google, in terms of uh, monopolizing the, the in-app payment. So that was, that was a big news to the technology, the fact that South Korean government, or the National Assembly were the first one to pass the legislation when there's a global discussion going on. Uh, and also we all couple saw that couple other antitrust regulation that's going after big tech, which is tends to be a trend uh, across the globe and also in the United States. So those are some of the active 
actions that South Korean government has been playing in the, in the tech uh, world. And it will be really interesting to see what the next president uh, will do and how that person will approach the tech industry and, and where South Korea will be headed for the next five years. And just very briefly uh, on the, the two leading candidates stance. So they seem to agree in principle that ICT sector is important as the part of the future, but I personally don't see that much of a difference uh, between two. Um, I would say the major difference is that President, um, sorry, um, candidate Lee Jae-myung tends to follow more of the footsteps of uh, President Moon Jae-in and, and he seems like he's willing to continue Moon's a path in terms of the government leading the, the pu uh, public initiative in terms of the big investment and effort. Uh, Yoon, on the other hand, he has talked about more relaxation of the regulations for companies and letting the private sector lead the effort. So I would say those are two of the main difference, but I feel like there hasn't been enough policy debates on these issue. Uh, there's a lot of, I'm sure we'll talk about later, about personal scandals and other things that are modeled into the election that we don't talk about the policy and the future of the, the economy and the country moving forward. So that's something that I'm hoping to hear more about as we get closer to the actual election date. Um, on the gender, so I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the gender divide uh, within South Korea. Unfortunately, it's not a new issue. It's been going on for decades. And with this election coming up, uh, it's been polarized on their gender line, especially among young voters. Um, just to give very brief uh, background on the gender inequality in South Korea, unfortunately, the, South Korea has the widest wage gap among the OECD countries, which is not the greatest sign. And we still see a very few uh, women represented in politics and business leadership. Uh, we often hear about the gender discrimination in the workforce. We also see many sexual harassment cases involving high government officials. And this is not to mention the huge digital sex crime scandal that we saw a couple of years ago. And continuing to see uh, um, other, other uh, gender related crimes that women have been facing. So obviously, I mean, you can imagine the South Korean women are very frustrated uh, with everything going on in South Korea and, and also with the gender discrimination. And they look to the government and the public to make the structural changes to make their lives better. Um, but South Korean men, on the other hand, uh, especially in their 20s, they feel that they are the one being discriminated against. So there is that uh, this disagreement to say the least, um, but the gender related debates, uh, especially online has been very ugly to say the least and also been very toxic as well. Um, and with, and, the, and with the, the gender discussion uh, is also reflected on the political scene as well. So we saw the, the PPP chairman, Lee Jun Suk was in, uh, appointed as the chairman and he has a very large support from the Korean male, especially in their 20s and 30s. And with, uh, with Lee Jun Suk on the side, um, candidate Yoon, continues to put out anti-feminist stance and policies. Namely, uh, you know, one of his big thing was abolishing the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family, saying that that's, that has, the, the ministry has not been doing this job of, of promoting equality and is actually discriminating the male. So that's been a big controversial debate point uh, in, in politics. So with that, Lee Jae-myung on the other hand, Unfortunately, he, ha I, he hasn't really defended the, the Korean woman either. So, uh, so well, while there's PPP candidate kind of tailing his platform towards young male voters, South Korean female voters are not really seeing anyone kind of approaching them with the, the policies that they would like. So um, traditionally, there has been South Korean women uh, voters who have voted for the Democratic Party, but they also see disappointment in different uh, responses of the DP handling different sexual harassment cases. They're also not seeing um, any support for them either. So there is a large uh, portion of undecided voters, especially among the Korean women that could make a big difference in this election. And again, this is a very simplified version of the gender issues. Um, 
but given the time, I'll stop here and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, during our Q&A session. Thank you very much, Song. Um, as you said, we only have time for a brief overview, but um, I really appreciated the detail you were able to go into. And we're going to um, go to Dr. Lee next. Uh, we, something we haven't really touched upon uh, other than Song, you mentioned it briefly, is that both candidates are tarred by scandal. They're facing corruption allegations. Um, their families are facing corruption and abuse of power allegations. Neither one really seems to have strong trust from the public. Um, and this obviously raises some deeper seated issues about the strength of South Korea's democracy, about the role of corruption, um, about the strengths and weaknesses of the Korean political system. You know, it, it might seem a bit esoteric to people outside Korea, but prosecution reform has been a major hot button issue um, in South Korea as well, um, particularly because Yoon himself was a prosecutor. And uh, so that's really coming to the fore. So Dr. Lee, can you give us an overview of how can we use the current campaign to look at these broader questions about South Korea's democracy and political system? Hey, Shannon, good morning from Seoul, because it's early in the morning, my voice is usually low, just understand this. Um, first of all, I'd like to concur with the Carl's assessment. Uh, the race is very tight, um, even though uh, opposition party candidate Yoon sung is, uh, is reported to lead several points, uh, but uh, you never know, it's very tight race. Um, so I think the uh, big issue is the, how the opposition parties can unify their candidate. Uh, the negotiation between Yoon sung yeol and An Chul Su is a big issue because An, uh, who is more centrist, he uh, usually gets the support from 7 to 10 percent. So whether the unification between An and Yoon can occur is a big uh, point we have to watch. Um, and uh, let's see this election. This election is a very rare case because two candidates of two major parties are not politicians. Uh, Lee Zemyeong, the ruling party candidate, was a mayor of Sangnam City and also governor of uh, uh, Gyeonggi province. So he uh, kind of uh, emerged as a more able, capable, uh, administrator, not a politician. So, so actually his ties to the ruling party uh, has never been that strong. And if you look at the, the opposition party candidate, Yoon sung uh, you know, he was uh, uh, nominated in, in by the President Moon Jae-in as a prosecutor uh, general, and he also investigated all the uh, issues related to previous government uh, of Park Geun-hye and, and so forth. I think uh, from the um, year uh, 2019, when Yoon was trying to investigate uh, sort of uh, the inner circle who are related to Moon Jae-in government, then he kind of uh, uh, created a conflict with the uh, the government and ruling power, including Blue House. So it's a very ironic that the, um, the not the typical conservative party uh, candidate, rather um, the prosecutor general who, who worked for this government emerged as a leader of opposition party. So this is a very unusual case. And, um, and of course, this is a very uh, I, I, I'm, this is a very uh, unusual because there are so many scandals, including the candidate themselves, especially uh, uh, the former Governor Lee over the case of the Dong scandal, and also his wife issues, and also Yoon sung uh, his wife, uh, and also his wife mother's uh, scandals as well. So there, there are many scandals. <laughs> and what's the public opinion of uh, the current election? Um, if you look at the poll, there is consistency about um, more than half of South Koreans, around 55%, want to change the government 
to the opposition party. Um, however, the support rate for the UN uh, is not matching to that kind of uh, 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 the public opinion. And uh, Lee Zemian is receiving um, quite around uh, 35, 36, let's say, for the liberal voters in South Korea. However, it's not exhausting uh, about uh, five or six uh, uh, percentage of uh, supporting rate for uh, the current President Moon Jae-in because President Moon uh, is enjoying around 40% of approval rate. So it's, a, it's, it's higher than the least uh, support. This, that's an interesting point. And whoever get elected uh, between Yoon and Lee, we worry because if uh, Governor Lee is elected, we worry about his economic populism because he has been very advocate, strong advocated the, uh, the basic wage uh, policy and, in, and, and he's just trying to spend uh, a lot of money for welfare and other um, economic policies. And if uh, Yoon is elected, we worry about uh, kind of uh, uh, the scoring deal with the Moon Jae-in government uh, because it's very ironic uh, to, to see the whole story. Um, Yoon has been very active correcting uh, the, the previous government's incumbents. Now he is trying to correct the this government uh, people who, who, who are related to these governments. So there will be, again, a lot of investigations. So we are afraid of, we can repeat uh, kind of uh, moral and legal um, uh, revenchisms. So the correcting the, the, the quote unquote accumulated or deep looted evils again. So that's a worrying point. Okay, but the basic background of uh, uh, the South Korean uh, democracy is that, well, we have a very strong presidency. So once uh, there is a, a new president, a new government, uh, there is a tendency of a winner takes all uh, uh, tendency. So many political elites are going to be changed. Every president is bowing to say, well, you know, I'm gonna be the uh, president, president of every uh, Koreans, but they never kept their promise after they get elected. So uh, that is uh, again related to very sharp political um, divide in Korea, especially at the level, elite level. So at the elite level, uh, the, the, the politics has very been divisive and they are attacking each other. So oh, I'm afraid to say that um, uh, the, the this election can worsen the existing trend of political divide among the elite level. And also uh, there will be again, the issue of uh, independence of uh, uh, the uh, judicial body. And also the, how we can reform genuinely about the prosecutor's office uh, because uh, the Moon Jae -in, uh, President Moon Jae in has tried to reform the prosecutor's office because many prosecutors tend to be political and politicized, so they worked closely with the ruling power. However, you know, during this process, uh, again, the current government has also revealed they are using the prosecutor's office uh, to their favor, not as a, the generally the Korean public didn't see the neutrality and independence of, uh, of a prosecutor's office. So again, uh, this is a big issue. And so we'll see um, up to the point, uh, even though there is a big scandal of uh, uh, the, the chief justice scandal uh, uh, from the previous government. And that was uh, uh, many judges were purged uh, by the current government. So uh, again, how we can gain the authority of a courthouse is uh, a big issue as well. So we'll see how we can mend 
and 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 and, and trying to, to unify the this divided politics in Korea, and that will be the big issues. I stop here and I will just try to answer a few questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Um, I want to kind of compare this election to the previous one, uh, which took place obviously right after the um, the impeachment of a South Korean president, which is a major historical event. Um, and now we're coming into this campaign and it seems like the mood is totally different. Um, everyone's disillusioned. Um, there's a lot of disappointment with the Moon administration, as you mentioned, Dr. Lee, even if it's not completely translating into support for the opposition candidate. Um, so what has changed? Um, is this a case of you know, Moon Jae-in not living up to his promises? Uh, is, has the pandemic really interfered with things? Um, you know, or is this just kind of a return to the to a, a more normal election cycle in South Korea? Um, Carl, I don't know if maybe you want to start since it's been a while since we heard from you. Yeah, the it, it's certainly different dynamics. Right, the last election uh, for for that turnout um, was fairly high. I think it was either the highest or the second highest uh, since uh, since Korea's democratization turnout was about seventy seven. I expect turnout to be significantly lower uh, this time around just because of the unfavorability of the candidates. But yeah, following the impeachment of Park Geun-hye, there was this real motivating factor. And it was clear at that time that Moon Jae-in was, was going to win. Right? There, there was a lot of movement behind him. And so we didn't have this real uh, contested race. Um, now, for, for the, the optics of it, right, you know, you, you mentioned the pandemic as being a part of this. I don't think that has played so much into it because the, the government, one of the most highly rated uh, points that people support or approve of President Moon's job approval or job performance is specifically on pandemic response, right? So every time we see these polls come out and they ask, well, he's got 35, 40% approval, the number one reason generally has been pandemic uh, response. So that, that hasn't played uh, an effect um, so much. It's mostly been about real estate, right? that, that real estate prices have spiked. There's an ongoing debate about how to tax these, about how to control the prices uh, and try to rein in some of the speculation, what you do with supply uh, and, and try to, especially in the Seoul and Gyeonggi area. So that's all, all playing into this. Um, yeah, I think others, others will also have, have views on that as well. Song, Dr. Lee, did you have anything to add? <clears throat> yeah, if I may. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, I think uh, the Moon Jae in government has started with uh, in a very legitimate government upholding the spirit of candlelight movement that impeached a previous uh, President Park Geun Hye. Um, and how. So, so, so there is a kind of moral victory for them uh, based on public support, but that waned it uh, after two years later. And uh, there is a policy failure definitely, as Carl has mentioned, especially housing price uh, when up, uh, like in very popular place like Seoul, the, the apartment price went up to 70%, even doubled the price. So there is a lot of uh, very uh, wide uh, criticism of this failure. And also we had, uh, so everybody got very you know, sensitive about all this uh, you know, housing price issues and real estate issues. And there was two scandals uh, last year, spring and, and, and early autumn, uh, LH scandal and also the Daejangdong scandal that gave a kind of, uh, you know, uh, this kind of explosive points so that many public are saying, what the hell, the, the public uh, corporations dealing with uh, housing and what the hell, you know, with this uh, at the uh, Songnam city, you know, for the land development, the officials are corrupted and, and, and that kind of thing. So there is a very resentment about this failure and also economic policy of this government has not been successful also. So, so that, that's very basic. And, and also one big, big issue is about the, uh, the moral hypocrisy. Uh, we call in Korea, 
and that that that, uh, that means um, there is a very this government has based uh, its legitimacy upon very moral, um, uh, very uh, justice uh, images. However, uh, uh, after the especially the scandal of a uh, former law minister Jogo, uh, and 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 there is a kind of and also there is a, some high ranking. Uh, this government officials uh, related to other corruption issues. So many public are disappointed that uh, the okay, this government is no exception. They are repeating uh, this kind of wrongdoings of uh, uh, political elite. And, and for me, just briefly on, on the young voters. Um, so the voters in 20s and 30s, they're one of the biggest supporters of Moon in 2017, and they had really high expectation and hope for Moon to bring the fair and just just government. And for all the reasons that Carl and Dr. Lee mentioned, all the scandals uh, related to Chogo, you know, having their family connection and their, their children uh, benefiting from all the family connection, and also the sexual harassment cases with the different uh, government officials and and DP's handling of those scandals was very disappointing for a lot of uh, young voters. Um, so for, for them, they they were really hoping that Moon will make their own individual lives better, but unfortunately, that's not something that they were seeing during Moon administration. And of course, the pandemic just intensified everything and, and hit them um, a lot. So like a lot of it, more than, for, especially for the voters in 20s and 30s, rather than the political idealization, it was more of, the personal impact that the, the administration and the whole situation uh, was having on their individual lives. So that's one of the reasons that caused them to shift uh, their support for the op opposition candidate and the, the reason why they're hoping to see a regime change. I'm gonna pull a question from the Q&A box and I'll remind our audience members, please feel free to, to leave questions there. This is your time. Uh, so I have a question from John Blondell who asks about issues of regionalism, uh, one candidate being strongly identified with a particular region. And I'll expand that a little bit um, to ask, you know, have we seen any changes in the regions that are you know, typically strongholds for one party? Um, is that holding true? Uh, are there shifts underway in the political geography of South Korea, uh, along with you know, the demography that we've already talked about a little bit? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Lee. Um, you know, the regionalism, yes, is still here in Korea. But if you compare presidential election and then uh, general election uh, electing MPs. In the MP case, general elections, the regionalism is much more stronger than in presidential elections. And uh, if you look at the presidential elections, uh, and, and usually, of course, the Yongnam area tend to be more conservative uh, versus Honam area is more leaning to uh, the center left or leftist party. And, and, and even in metropolitan area uh, is a real place to compete uh, because all this regionalism is mixed. However, this uh, influence of regionalism has been um, uh, reduced and even Yoon song Yeol is expecting uh, winning more than 10% uh, in the Honam area. Uh, so we will see um, the regionalism is losing its influence while the ideology and generation gap are going to be uh, very important. So, so that's why the centrist voters tend to have a casting votes and because the younger ones and centrists are not tied to regionalism uh, and, and also less so to some ideology. Carl or Sung, did either of you want to chime in on that question? Okay, so uh, we have a question also from Marilyn Strickland about uh, 
Is there a, a get out the vote effort, particularly for women and the voter participation rate of women in South Korea? Um, so Song, I think this one is headed your way. I would also ask generally, you know, how important are women seen as a voting block? Because you mentioned briefly in your comments that there seems to be a lot of effort on the part of the Yoon campaign to reach out to men, but maybe not a corresponding effort on the part of the uh, Lee campaign to reach out to women. Uh, so kind of what's going on there? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, so I would say generally, uh, South Korean women have very high voting uh, turnout rate. So I believe, um, I think they had it slightly higher than men in the last presidential election and the one before, I believe the number is around 76, 75. So it's relatively high. Uh, but my concern for this upcoming election is that, uh, as Carl mentioned earlier, the unfavorability, like they don't like the either candidate. So they're not sure which one to vote for because they don't like either of them. So that would be the concern. Um, and I think particularly for this election, there's been so much focus on the young male voter, which I don't think we've seen the case in the previous uh, elections. So the attention has been focused on that side and obviously the candidates who are seeing the shift um, in the polling numbers, they are tailoring their the platform is to cater to that audience. Um, but we're not seeing much for the female voters, which I'm hoping to to see more as we get closer to the to the voting day. Any other thoughts from Dr. Lear Carl on this? Yeah. Well, um, the Korean men, males, especially in their 20s, are unified. As you can see in the by-election of last year, the electing the mayor of Seoul and Busan, uh, young males uh, did a, did a very a strong job uh, for you know, as electing these opposition uh, candidates. Then why not for women? Because uh, the first of all, as uh, uh, Sang has mentioned, um, the both parties are tainted in a, uh, to the lens of a young woman because many sex scandals uh, of Seoul mayor and Busan uh, were the ruling party may, uh, mayors, um, and and also the, the now the opposition party uh, is more trying to. to uh, kind of uh, um, get the vote from organized, more strong, uh, unified male voters. So they are not um, trying to, to uh, promote the, the feminist uh, agenda because they will collide with the, their male supporters. Uh, and, uh, and also, if I talk to young women in Korea, but the feminism is not unifying Korean women, even though they see there are many uh, problems for sexual violence and uh, still gender discrimination against the women. Many young women are thinking that they are brought up quite in an equal gender, uh, equal uh, environment, education wise, and also job entrance and so forth. So um, the, the feminist agenda uh, is not uniting the young woman, and so that's why uh, it, it, they are kind of uh, kind of uh, fragmented. Unlike the Korean males who think that they are discriminated because of this pro-woman government. We also have a question on the foreign policy front. So, Carl, I will aim this at you. Um, this is from Martin Kohling. Um, Carl mentioned that foreign policy is not playing a big role in voter decision making right now, but what position regarding China and the US has more support among the public? Um, and then also a question about Japan, obviously South Korea, Japan relations are very fraught. Um, what role is that playing in the campaign as well? Yeah, so attitudes towards China um, have been negative for a while and have kind of flared up recently during the Olympics with controversy over, over some of the short track uh, skating. Um, so we've seen images of people um, kind of tearing up Chinese flags. Uh, how, how big that, that actual event was, I didn't see from the rest of the pictures, 
but certainly uh, sentiment towards China had, has fallen significantly. I remember looking at data where favorability of Xi Jinping at 2014, 2015 was something like 55%, um, far above any other leader. And then it's since fallen in 2020, it was about 20%. And I imagine it's continued to fall uh, sharply since then. And now we're seeing favorability of China overall somewhere in the neighborhood of Japan and North Korea, right? It, it's very low, especially considering at one point we thought it might uh, approach the United States and maybe even take over the United States. And I think those days are, are long gone. Um, but the other part of that, you know, you, there's a broad recognition that China is an important you know, economic partner. But when we ask the, the Korean public whether or not China is uh, an economic partner or an economic threat, uh, a clear majority says China is actually an economic threat uh, on that. And, you know, when we ask them about security, is China a security partner or a security threat? Clear majority says China is a security threat. Uh, that being said, we, we, we also ask about the, this idea of, well, if you have to build up the alliance or strengthen the alliance with the United States, or if you want to build a new partnership with China, um, if you give them three options, or if you give them two options, rather, if you say, oh, is it China or the US? Uh, in general, they're going to prefer the US. And that's, that's a majority as well, probably 55, 60% say, yeah, we should focus on the US and not, even if it means worsening relations with China. But the reality is, if you add in the third option of, well, we need to do, do both, which is kind of what, what both candidates, Lee Jae Myung is stronger on that, saying we need to be equidistant. Ultimately, I think you will also do the same. That's where actually the public is. And that's not even close. There's a really strong preference and realization that both countries are going to be important and that just Korea's economic situation is, is what it is and that, that China is going to be important in that. And that's all, again, that's coming out of the Yoon campaign as well. Maybe not in the policy platform, but certainly in the quotes from his key foreign policy advisors that, that yes, we can't only be tough and talk tough on China, that economics is going to have a large role to play in this. On Japan, uh, no matter who is elected, I don't really foresee any major improvements uh, coming down. Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm sure it could always get worse but it's hard to predict, predict ways in, in which it can get worse. You know, they, the, the Yoon campaign has one of the most kind of connected, uh, connected foreign policy experts in Japan. Um, I know he's been, I'm sure he's been working behind the scenes to try to, to separate this out as a two-track and say, okay, let's deal with history and security issues separately. Um, but I also think it's a mistake to put this all on Korea, right? To say that it's only Korea that needs to start to bridge this divide because when you have you know, uh, what was it, 100 lawmakers from Japan visiting Yasukuni on, on Pearl Harbor Day, that sends a poor message. And so there's also steps that Japan needs to take if they want this relationship to get better. So let's not pretend that it's, it's only the South Korean elections and politicians that are, are going to determine uh, the future of this. Dr. Lee, did you want to, to add on to this? Uh, yes, I think uh, Kai's assessment is, uh, I think I, I agree most of his point. And uh, if we see the poll, um, there's the, the, the Korean public uh, is has been very much favorable to the USA. That has been uh, observed in many polls for the last five or six years. Um, on the other hand, the China poll, uh, the Korean sentiments towards China has been uh, turning to the negative side, especially after the, uh, the China economic uh, retaliation over the introduction of thought to Korean soil. Uh, and, and, and that was uh, quite uh, you know, regarded as a kind of shock because the, oh, China is retaliating Korea, even though the, whether we introduce anti-missile, any weapons is our national sovereignty issues, that kind of things. And also recently, there is a cultural uh, kind of a conflict, especially for the young Koreans, they regard all this Korean dress and Korean kimchi or whatever, uh, they see the China as a cultural imperialism. So, so there is a, another layer of this cultural issues. You know, the Koreans became very much, they become a, the, the globally a uh, very strong cultural nation with the BTS and the uh, Squid Game and so forth. Uh, so they think um, uh, they have a right to, to, to claim the, 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 the pride, the cultural pride of, of South Koreans. Um, 
Okay, but nevertheless, yes, it's true. Because of economic ties to to China, there is a certain limit to all these, you know, some little things uh, of this anti-China feelings can can expand. There is a limit for that. And for Japan, yes, it's true. Uh, as you have seen, um, the the foreign affairs article by uh, Yun Song Myo, uh, there is a kind of a very strong uh, motivation to normalize relations with with Japan. And if you see also the Indo-Pacific strategy just released from White House, and one of the action plan is uh, strengthening U.S. Korea Japan tripartite relations. So I'm sure. Uh, if the UN is elected in particular, and even Lee is elected, the new government is trying to, to improve relations with Japan. So I think uh, if there is a certain gesture from Korean side, the Kishida government, Kishida cabinet, uh, cabinet should take this move from new Korean government in a more constructive way. Yeah, I think that's something that sometimes gets overlooked. Um is that Japan also has a new-ish prime minister, even though it wasn't the outcome of a, uh, <laughs> it was internal party politics that, rather than the, the general election that really cemented his position. But there is an opportunity for change, but as Carl was saying, it's, it's gonna take both sides, um, not just a new Korean president will suddenly change everything. Um, uh, we have another question from Katie Kim about comments on the uh, MZ, the younger generation, uh, and their involvement in the 2022 election. Are we expecting higher turnout from young voters? Um, I would ex expand a little bit to say, are we seeing a, a heavy focus from the campaigns on these voters? I know a lot of policies have seemed to be targeting the youth vote. Um, are they? are they seen as playing a particularly important role in the upcoming election? And Song, maybe we can start with you. Sure, uh, and, and thank you for the question. So the voter, the, the MZ generation, or you know, sometimes they are called 20, 30 generation, uh, they're, they're increasing, they're uh, a big chunk of undecided voters and the swing voters um, in this election. And, and a lot of people see, including the candidates, see them as an important player in the election. Uh, when, it, when you get the generation, so people over 60, they tend to vote very conservative, 50s, kind of divided, but mostly conservative. People in the 40s uh, usually vote for the Democratic candidate. In 20s and 30s, uh, they are not tied to any political ideology or party. They tend to change their minds depending on the issues or the, the candidates that they they want to support. So there are, uh, so in terms of a size, there are about a, a third of a, eligible voters in South Korea. And because candidates are not sure where they will be swing one or the other, it's kind of, they're also on their edge uh, trying to get their votes as much as they can. Um, so in terms of the policy, uh, because they're targeting the same group of people, uh, sometimes the policy is put out by uh, Lee Jae Myung and also Yoon are overlap in some in certain cases. So, like when it comes to real estate, they both have, you know, promise to dedicate some portion of the new housing development towards the the young generation. They even talked about uh, the cryptocurrency as part of their their uh, platform. They even talked about gaming and what chances of getting certain items, policy things like that. Um, so they are putting sort of policies to attract them, but. Uh, but to be honest, I kind of feel like they're just putting the policies out there just for the vote. So there's not enough structure. In, um, I'm not sure if there will be a follow up through all the promises they're they're making. And also, we saw during the TV debate, uh, the second debate, that when the topic itself was on the 2030 voters, uh, we they talked about scandals again. So again, that's that's a good representation of you know candidates trying to put out policies to attract the voters. But when it comes to substance and implementation, unfortunately, isn't really there. So we're really interested to see what the, the 2030 voters decide on um, on the upcoming election. But they've been they their turnout has been very high in 2017 election. Yeah, to, to follow up on that, on Sung's kind of a really good overview of, of how the, the generations break out. Um, the turnout was high in, in the last election. Of course, that was following the, the candlelight uh, protest and the, the impeachment. This time around, when we look at vote intention, 
uh, vote intention is really low among the 20s. So uh, ahead of the, the last election, vote intention of the 20s, people who said they were certain to vote looked just like every other demographic. This is usually like 70, 80, 80 to 85% uh, saying they were certain to vote this time around. Just in the 20s, it's more like 55 to 65%. So there's been a steep drop off. And this is one of the things I find really interesting about, about Yoon's campaign strategy is that yes, he's courting the kind of anti-feminist young men uh, and at the same time abandoning the kind of the, the female vote in, in a lot of ways. But the real question is, are these young men gonna turn out? Right? Is in, in the vote intention, it looks like they are not going to do that. And especially considering that, you know, this isn't really based on, on policy so much, it's largely based on they want a change of government, I think as, as, as Dr. Lee noted, uh, before that there's this, you know, just kind of antipathy towards how the Moon administration ended and they, they eventually want to, to kick, kick them out. Um, in the 30s, their vote intention is, is quite high like ever, everyone else's. Um, the other part of that turnout question is what's going to happen on the progressive side. Uh, if you look in the data, their vote intention is quite high. Uh, it's kind of looks like almost every previous election, but anecdotally, in every person I've talked to who is who is an acknowledged, they acknowledge themselves that they are going to vote progressive, that they generally vote that way. Almost every person has said either they're, 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 they're most likely not going to vote this time or they're going to vote for a third party candidate. And they're saying for the first time in their lives, them and their friends are considering not voting. So there's a real question about what turnout it is going to look like in the end. So I'll end with kind of a broader question. Um, Carl, at the very beginning of your presentation, you mentioned the uh, the election fraud narrative, which obviously sounds very familiar to uh, those of us in the United States. And we actually had a question in the Q and A. Um, you know, are we seeing similar trends as we as in U.S. elections? Um, so, to what extent are we having sort of a convergence in South Korea and US politics, uh, particularly on the conservative side. Is, is that a comparison we should be making um, or paying attention to? Because many other countries, uh, you know, Australia in particular, uh, we have seen the kind of the rise of the Trump or Trump light uh, mentality among conservative voters. Is that something that's happening in Korea? Um, right right now, uh, right now, it's really difficult for me to assess how strong the election fraud narrative is going to be. I've seen a lot of the emails that are already being sent to the foreign correspondents here, uh, trying to build that narrative. Uh, there have also been protests led by by a former prime minister saying that you know China is going to to uh, somehow fix this election that the Moon administration is is cooperating with China uh, to do this. Um, you know, to, to the credit of the, the uh, opposition party, after they lost the last National Assembly election and they lost it, you know, in a major way, kind of a historic way, they basically disassociated themselves from anyone who was, was running out this election fraud narrative. Um, they put these people kind of out to pasture, didn't really, didn't really ever bring them back in. And even they themselves said, no, this isn't, we don't see any evidence of election fraud. We're not going to pursue it. However, you know, with, with the infrastructure, that has been put in place via YouTube, via video, from kind of these right-wing platforms. Um, will, the, will it be the same this time around after they've had several years to, to do this? So far, I haven't seen any indication of mainstream uh, conservative politicians picking up on that. Will that change after the election? I don't know. Uh, as far as the comparison uh, between uh, the Korea and the US, yeah, there, there are certainly compar comparisons there that they're, they're heading down this election fraud path or at least entertaining it. But I, I don't know if I have any real insight on, on if it's appropriate uh, to make that comparison. And I see Dr. Lee has unmuted herself, so maybe she has better insight than me. Yeah. Uh, in the election fraud narratives, um, yes, it was uh, quite um, vocal after the April general election of uh, year 2020. Um, it was led by. Uh, far right groups, you know, using um, YouTubers and so forth. And so the mainstream conservative groups and including conservative party who lost heavily in the general election, uh, tried to, to keep the distance from this group. Um, 
I don't think the majority of Koreans, mainstream Koreans, don't buy this uh, election fraud narratives because our national election, uh, the the council is based on constitution, and it, they are doing their jobs very well. So uh, for the integrity and neutrality of uh, you know managing the whole election process. So I think that there is a high public trust in NEC. Uh, and, and, and so this kind of narrative will not work unlike in the USA. Okay. Song, did you wanna add anything on this before we wrap up? Oh, I think Carl and Dr. Lee added all the good points. Well, thank you very much to our panelists for joining us. Um, I really learned a lot. I hope that our audience did as well. And of course, we will all be following the results three weeks from now uh, when we see the answers to some of these questions. Some of them, as, as we were talking about, are going to be longer term issues. And so thank you again for joining us. And I hope to see everyone at the next Diplomat webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us.